Hi, I'm Aaron, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I'm at the American Museum of Western Art with Philip Anschutz talking about his new book, Out Where the West Begins, Volume 2. Phil, I'm going to start off with uh, thanking you for joining me, number one. Aaron, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on your show. Thank well, you. You're welcome. Um, it's great having you on. We did, of course, did Out Where the West Begins, uh, your first book. Uh, I want you to, to tell me why, as an author, you felt volume two was necessary. And I've got to tease you a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not giving you a lot of credit for the creativity of the title of the second book. Uh, well, I stole the title for the first and the second book from a poem, so um, that's okay. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, you referred to me as an author. That's very kind of you, Aaron, although I don't think of myself as an author. Maybe someday I, I would aspire to be one, but uh, for now, I'm an enthusiastic hobbyist. Uh, history has always been uh, a hobby of mine. And I've always felt that if you have a hobby, you kind of owe it to yourself to do something about it. Uh, for me, that translated into writing two books. Uh, Should you have been a history teacher? Well, as you know, because I've told you this, and I mentioned it in, my, in both books, actually, my mother uh, was a school teacher. And her dream for me was to be a history professor someday. Uh, regrettably, uh, I didn't do that. I took up a different line of work, as you know. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think I would have enjoyed being uh, a history professor because I because I enjoy history. T tell me why you decided to do volume two. What you know, um, as I was about halfway through volume one, which really dealt with fifty individuals. Uh, with business uh, uh, backgrounds that made a dramatic impact on the development of the American West, I realized I was writing the wrong book. What I should be writing about uh, is the history of the West in a much broader context. Uh, but I thought, well, let's finish volume one and then we'll think about volume two. So volume two deals with, uh, with 100 people. And these are people who are political and military leaders, religious thinkers, civil rights proponents, uh, early uh, women suffragists, African-American pioneers, writers and artists, explorers and surveyors, architects, inventors, innovators. In other words, a broad cross-section of people of what it takes to supply the foundation and the civilization of the American West. Uh, and this, the thing I dealt with in the first book as well as in the second is how did this all come to pass, particularly in such a short period of time. Both books, as you know, deal with the time period from generally 1800 to 1920. Now just think of that, 120 years, starting in 1800 and starting at the Mississippi River, which uh, I've denoted as kind of the beginning uh, of where the West starts, nothing was known about anything west of the Mississippi River. Very few, very few people had even uh, visited it. No one knew anything about the topography, the geology, the geography. Who lived there? What kind of people they were? Didn't know anything. Yet by 1920, just that period of 120 years, and just that area from west of the Mississippi to the Pacific Ocean, standing on its own, was probably the fourth largest industrial power in the world. You also reference in the book, which I thought was fascinating, uh, Thomas Jefferson's perspective on when all of that would happen, when 1920 would occur. And instead of the 120 years, he, was, he literally was projecting almost 10 times as long. Um, although you're not supposed to have favorites, I suppose, I must admit Thomas Jefferson has always been a personal favorite of mine. For that time period, the late 1700s, very early 1800s, he was probably the world's authority 
on the American West, although he himself knew very little about it. And had never, of course, gone and there. He'd never been uh, west of the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, and he thought that it would take a thousand years, a thousand, simply to populate the West. And his idea, of course, for our country, and particularly the American West, was a economy and a civilization based on agrarian, based on farming and agrarian settlement. He thought it would take a thousand years. Now, he was a very wise individual, very smart, uh, very learned, well-read, but just think of that. He was wrong. Yeah, by, by, an, or, by an order of magnitude, which is, yes. is, is pretty, pretty amazing. But when you think, uh, uh, again, you, in an earlier question, you asked, what, what, what was it that made me think about the second book? It was, how could all of this have happened in this short period of time? Well, of course, what I came to realize, it didn't just happen in 120 years. The basis for what really happened uh, goes back several hundred years uh, as the groundwork was laid and all the things that were going on in the world at the time. And quite frankly, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat of a wonder to me that we're not sitting here uh, under a, a parliament and a, a king and a house of commons or speaking Spanish. Or, or speaking Spanish or French to each other this morning. Or even maybe Russian. <laughs> or Russian. I, I, don't think, I don't think most Americans realize uh, that, that Russia was on our continent for, uh, you know, in a considerable way. Well, think, think about this, and, and I hope your audience will think about this. You know, you, you had this small little collection of colonies kind of clinging to this existence uh, along the Atlantic Ocean with less than four million people, no real commerce and industry, uh, no real structure of government to it. No real military. Well, you, 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 you had a situation where you, this these lands and this country was surrounded by these four world powers. You had England, obviously, you had France, you had Spanish, and you had Russia, all of which had standing armies and navies. Obviously, the colonies had none. All of which had broad commerce and industry all of which had aspirations, I can guarantee you, on these lands, and I might add, in almost every case, better land claims than, 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 than America at that time had. As you said a moment ago, there was no standing military. You know, when you have a system of government and you have a state that, that aspires to be a state, you need at least three things. First of all, you need the ability to, to tax and a reasonable expectation of, of getting proceeds from the taxation. That was not the case in the colonies. You need to be able to develop and sustain a commercial base. Uh, that really wasn't the, uh, the situation either. We were highly dependent upon, upon England, France, and Spain, and others. And last of all, you need the ability to raise an army and protect the citizenry. And that wasn't the case. There was no basis, actually, for the colonies to have become, eventually, uh, a republic and a country. I know, and one of the really fascinating aspects that I think comes across in the book, and I know we have to take a quick break right now, is the fragility of America. And when we come back, I'd like, to, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, because I think very few Americans today understand that what we have today easily could not have happened. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with Philip Anschutz in just a moment. 
For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind-the-scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind-the-scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We're with Philip Anschutz, the author of Out Where the West Begins, Volume 2. Okay, I'm going to start off with a trivia question, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to, and a friend of mine sent this to me. Who was the only American who was a U.S. representative, a U.S. senator, governor of two states, and president of his country? Sounds like John Adams, but I can't. No. Nope. Sam Houston. I guess that's right. <laughs> I guess that's right. I had now tell me why it's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Texas was, was one of the countries, I presume. That's right. Texas was a republic. Yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who he asked me, he loved asking me that, well, and, don't, and I got it wrong. Don't take any more trivia questions from your friends to try and, to, uh, try and fool me with, okay? All right, I promise I, promise I won't. Yeah, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, in Out Where, the West, Out Where the West Begins, Volume 2. Uh, I'm just a curiosity kind of background. Was it easier writing a second book than a first? Uh, I think it was harder, and it needed more research. Uh, on, on, on book one, I knew the stories of most of these people already, not the details, but the stories. Uh, but uh, book two, uh, frankly, some of the people that ended up in book two surprised me as well. Uh, I selected them, uh, but I was surprised by my own selection. And I'll talk about one or two of those in a, in a moment. But. Can I come back to Jefferson for just sure. a moment? What, what an in, interesting fellow he was. And I, I talked a little bit about him being a perfect example of the Renaissance man in an age of enlightenment, which was this time period that started in the late 1700s. He was the epitome of that. He started out as probably being a Francophile, a devotee of most things French. He didn't end up that way, uh, uh, as, uh, certainly as he was, uh, became president, because uh, he greatly feared the power and the militancy of Napoleon and what Napoleon's intentions were. Uh, he and Adams both led uh, uh, Jefferson was really the head of the Republican Party, Adams being the head of the Federalist Party. Uh, the, uh, Jefferson and the Republican Party b believed that, that power should really be at the state level and uh, a much more liberal approach to many policies. Adams and, and, uh, and Hamilton both uh, believed you should have a strong central government. Now, in the end, our system is a combination of the, in many ways, of, of those two things. Uh, but 
there's so many backstories, and as, as I said earlier, I like to have backstories uh, to, to in the book so people can connect uh, with with who that individual is, and there's so many on both on both sides. You know, but, one of the themes uh, in the book is about. Uh, how people were successful due to the, to the freedom they had, uh, the access to resources they had. Um, how would you contrast that today uh, in, in terms of we, we now live in a, a certainly hyper-regulated society, and when you compare what happened and how fast it happened in the West, whether it be with the Homestead Act or uh, the, as railroads progressed west, uh, contrast the two Americas today. I'd be really interested. And what can we learn from the West? Well, let me start on a slightly different issue, and that is uh, we think, many of us think, or at least I thought at one point, that the Founding Fathers must have gotten along just swimmingly. <laughs> they must have worked in a cooperative way, which they did, they accomplished many things uh, together, which they did, but nothing could have been further from the truth. It, it, it was highly partisan. And by the way, politics was quite vicious. Uh, the, uh, the example of uh, John Adams and uh, Thomas Jefferson is a great example. They started out as friends in the time period of 1774, 75, leading up to 1776. Uh, they worked together on the Constitution. But then they became bitter enemies. Uh, both ran for political office. Um, uh, both uh, led factions of the country, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and they were bitter enemies and attacked each other incessantly. Uh, uh, oddly enough, and you may know this, but many people don't, uh, exactly 50 years later, in 1826, on July 4th, the very day, they both died. Yeah, that was amazing. Of natural causes. Yeah, uh, amazing. Well, you talked about uh, uh, politics in, in that era. Uh, certainly, I think a lot of people today don't realize how personalized the, some of those attacks were, uh, which make even to, by today's stand, today looks tame often in comparison. Let, let, let me give you another example. <laughs> Thomas Hart Benton. Senator for 30 years. Senator for 30 years uh, after Jefferson, uh, probably uh, one of the strongest proponents of expansion into the American West. Uh, certainly involved in almost everything of importance that happened politically uh, uh, in, in terms of legislation for that 30-year period. But some of the stories about him are quite unusual. As an example, uh, after the Battle of New Orleans, and that was the conclusion of the War of 1812, he was never a friend of Andrew Jackson. Uh, on his way home from the war, they happened to run into each other at a roadside tavern. Jackson and his cronies, and Thomas Hart Benton and uh, uh, one or two of his brothers. They got into a fight, and it is said that Thomas Hart Benton shot Andrew Jackson. Clearly, Andrew Jackson was managed to get himself shot. The only question is, was it really Thomas Hart Benton? Now, later in political life, they became fast friends and political allies. Another backstory on Thomas Hart Benton, he, was, he had quite a temper. He was a colorful figure. He was colorful. And uh, keeping in mind what I said about how partisan politics could be, uh, he got uh, uh, very upset with one of his political opponents, challenged him to a duel. Uh, they had the duel. He wounded his opponent. And that wasn't enough. And that wasn't enough. As soon as the fellow recovered, he challenged him to another duel, and the next time killed him. Now, that's partisan politics for you. So how could things get done in that environment? 
one, one wonders. Well, but, maybe things aren't as bad today as I thought. But what I think is most of these men had a vision about what the West could become. Uh, and they were committed to the, vi the vision. Today, we would probably call that nation building. Then they called it manifest destiny, fulfilling the manifest destiny of America. And they believed it. What about, you know, uh, you mentioned, you know, of course, uh, we talked a lot about Jefferson. How about John Quincy Adams and, and the, some of his extraordinary accomplishments? Uh, in many ways, uh, he was probably one of the instigators uh, of the, uh, after the uh, Stamp Act was imposed by the British um, taxing American commerce. He was probably one of the principal instigators of the American Revolution. Uh, he, he, he campaigned for it. He wrote pamphlets on behalf and books on behalf of it. Possibly the smartest of all the founders. I mean, he was a very intelligent guy and, uh, and he could write well. One of the uh, principal authors of the American Constitution. Uh, but he, he was often thought to be quite uh, so firm in his beliefs that he had trouble compromising. Uh, I think, and if you're seeking political solutions, sometimes you need to be able to have the art of compromise. Uh, maybe he wasn't so strong at times on that. But on the other hand, uh, a huge contributor to the American Republic. We enjoy it today. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back to talk more about Out Where the West Begins in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbour Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back. We're talking about Out Where the West Begins, Volume 2. This is a great potential textbook. And has there been any exploration of using either book 
uh, because of what I referenced before, that each chapter gives you an opportunity to use it as a stepping off point to, to much, much more. So uh, I know I haven't asked you this uh, before, but is anybody looking at it in that context? Well, one of the reasons why I did the book in the first place uh, was the hope that young people would want to read it. Uh, and I think that's been the case because I've given away uh, hundreds of these books uh, to libraries and schools. Uh, please contact us. We'll be pleased to send books uh, for free because uh, uh, I want students to read them. I, I want to go to the timeline. I'm going to make you go through it a little quicker because you now only have like three minutes left, but hit some of the highlights. Well, just a couple. Uh, in 1803, uh, Lewis and Clark are sent out by Jefferson. We began to explore the West. 1812 comes the Second War of Independence, uh, which ended in 1819. Uh, see, we annexed Texas uh, in 1845. And of course, Texas, uh, uh, Texas had been part of Mexico. Uh, then it, uh, it got its own independence. In 1846, uh, we went to war with Mexico. In 1848, we settled with Mexico and took over generally the southwest part of what we now know as the United States of America. Uh, 1861 is really the seminal moment in, in American history, the Civil War. The problems with slavery are addressed which, of course, everyone knew existed uh, when they were trying to develop the original 1776 document uh, and later the, con the American Constitution. Everyone knew those problems existed. But they elected, quite frankly, to kick the can down the road because the primary objective was to see if we could develop a country. Uh, and that's what happened, unfortunately those problems came home to roost in 1861. Right, and of course uh, you referenced the Missouri Compromise uh, and also how, uh, how that evolved uh, in, in later in terms of uh, the battle of you know, what, what should the new states uh, be able to do. But talk just, and I know we're about to be out of time, but uh, I'd be really interested in your take on slavery because slavery struck me as as either an issue in the forefront or the background on a 24-7 basis throughout this 120-year well, period? Uh, let me make, make a comment, Aaron, if I may, on slavery, but I don't want to address it now because there's, with the time left, I want to talk about a couple of individuals. But what I said was true. Th they were trying to develop a republic. Uh, clearly, there were many points of view on many issues slavery being an important one, but hardly the only one. But you had to bring the North and the South together. So what they were looking for is what things could people agree on in order to, to develop a republic. That's what they did. Everyone knew they were kicking the problem, uh, the can down the road, so to speak. Uh, but it really wasn't addressed till the Civil War. Let me talk about a couple of individuals, if I can. Sure. Uh, Jefferson, I've already said that he was, he was the best informed, uh, the most knowledgeable about the American West. If there was ever a Renaissance man, uh, he was it. Uh, he was a scholar. He was a musician. Uh, he was a writer. He was a politician. He was many things. Uh, he also led what we would know as a... It was called then the Republican Party. We wouldn't identify it particularly today with the Republican Party. Uh, and the leader of the, the Federalist Party was Adams. Uh, Adams and Hamilton. Uh, but Jefferson and, and Adams had an interesting history. Uh, and they died on the same day, 50 years later, July 4th, 1826. Well, and uh, actually, we're at, the, we're at the end of part one of, of our series. So we're going to take uh, a break as long as you want, because this is the end of part one. Please join us for part two with Philip Anschutz. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.